10 miles of rough road. <laughs> Everyone put a one in the chat for Joyce. So who exactly is Foodie Beauty? I have to admit, until a few months ago, I thought Foodie Beauty and the Hungry Fat Chick were the same person. I'm not interested in mukbangs, so I never watch their content. It turns out they're very different in their personality. Foodie Beauty is a social media person from Canada who vlogs her life. As someone who has trained, taught and instructed thousands of girls and women over the years, I assume she was approaching retirement age. I was a little shocked then to find that she was actually under 40. Contrary to what people may assume, I actually don't care what adults look like. If people want to adopt lifestyle choices that make them look 10, 20, 30 years older, that is up to them. The only people I'm really concerned about are children and teenagers. I am obligated to give them the correct information about diet and fitness. Now, if they choose to ignore it when they get older, that's on them. Watching the first few hours of Foodie Beauty videos, I thought she's a woman who's proud of her body, so there's nothing really here to analyse at all. I initially thought she accepted what she had done to her body with her own lifestyle choices with grace. But after watching more of her videos, she seemed to be very angry. In fact, a lot of the time she was incandescent with rage and very bitter and hostile. Single fucking average size body piece of shit on the fucking plane can kiss my fucking ass. Oh, sorry. You know what? I'm going to say that too. I'm going to say that too. Oh, sorry, I'm infringing on your little piece of shit fucking airplane space, skinny asshole. I don't care. She would often create situations and scenarios that were negative so she could argue with people that didn't really exist. And when I say don't really exist, I mean they don't exist at all. But what made me eventually throw my hat into the foodie beauty ring and get involved was her claims about fitness and exercise. I found while Amberlynn Reed would Frankenstein genuine health and fitness information together to fit her own narrative, foodie beauty would just create things. She would lie. 47, you cannot do more than me, bitch. 47, you cannot do more than me, bitch. I just watched 25 minutes, biatch. What? Huh? What? Yeah, let's not go there. She's her first marathon at 76 years old. And this weekend, her hand to her heart, about to do it again at 92. <laughs> On the left, there's Harriet, a two-time cancer survivor. Her 16th marathon, this one in San Diego. Seven hours, 24 minutes later. <laughs> You cannot do more than me, bitch. Having run several senior walking groups with people who are over 90, our sessions are 60 minutes. 25 minutes would be our warm up. The way she spoke about things was beyond a lie. It seemed as if she had never seen another human. Watching even more of her videos, I changed my mind a bit. I think she genuinely believes she is fitter and looks much younger than she actually does. In her head, everything she says is true. So I'm going to try to show you how her mind works. When I was at university, I had a professor who always vowed to fail students that try to do research on human nature 
just by using five of their friends or their roommates. His logic was you could not possibly understand human nature by looking at five people out of 7.5 billion people. He said we should try to imagine the 7.5 billion people on the planet all are jigsaw pieces. You cannot work out what a 7.5 billion piece jigsaw puzzle will be just by five pieces. You can't see the bigger picture. Similarly, you can't work out what human nature is like just by speaking to five of your friends. He knew that we couldn't do research on 7.5 billion people, but he always encouraged us to work with as many people as possible for any research that we conducted. The more people that we interacted with, the more pieces of the puzzle that we got, the more that we would see the bigger picture. So whether we were doing psychological research, physical research or sociological research, we had to get as many puzzle pieces as possible to understand humans. So now we can take that information back to Foodie Booty. Foodie Booty has a very reclusive lifestyle. While she is not technically a shut-in, she travels in society in a protective bubble. She actively avoids interacting with the public or strangers. So without human interaction, she just hasn't collected a great deal of those puzzle pieces. She tries to make sense of the world with the few puzzle pieces that she has, rather like a child who has a few puzzle pieces because they don't have life experiences, tries to make sense of the world. As children, we have very few puzzle pieces because we have no life experience and we interact with very few people. As we age, we interact with more people, we get more puzzle pieces, we get a better understanding of what humans are. But if you don't interact with people as you grow up or as an adult, it doesn't matter how old you are or how much academic prowess you have, your view on the world will still remain childlike. I admit, at one point when watching her videos, I actually thought it was either a joke and she was a paid actress, or this was some form of sociological experiment. It was just confusing that somebody of her age was acting like she was new to the world, such as being an alien or a newborn, but she was living in the world. But that was my bad, as she wasn't living in the world at all. She lives on the edge of the world, avoiding humans. And when she does have to interact with humans face to face, she cocoons herself in a bubble and has as little interaction with people as possible. So while she may be able to tell us about her personal relationships, she will never be able to tell us about the world because she simply hasn't interacted with enough people. Now, this explained her ignorance of humans, but it didn't explain her aggression and her hatred. Namely, why was this woman so angry? To find out why, I had to split YouTubers and social media people into three categories. And these were the average Joes, the influencers, and the antisocial oddities. So let's look at the average Joes. These consist of students and adults in paid or unpaid work. I consider charity and voluntary work as bona fide work. The average Joe takes part in social media as an extension of their job, as a platform for their hobby, or just to say to the world, I was here. 
Next, we have the influencers. Now, a lot of them have started as the average Joes. They will have millions of followers, lucrative advertising and sponsorship deals, and loads of collaborations. They are paid and bankrolled to show how fantastic life can be when you've got money. And the final category is the antisocial oddity. These people do exist in everyday life, but because they're antisocial, we tend not to interact with them. We are curious because they're different and they are not like the people that we interact with on a daily basis. So social media gives us a portal into their lives and it also gives them a portal to communicate with people that they would be ignoring on a daily basis. So here comes the fun part. Did Foodie Beauty fit into being an average Joe? Nope, because she wasn't a student, she wasn't in gainful employment, she wasn't doing charity work, she wasn't doing voluntary work, she wasn't working from home, she wasn't a remote worker. There were no managers, supervisors, agents, work colleagues, nobody. So if she wasn't an average Joe, was she an influencer? There was a recurring theme in her rants that her audience were jealous of her beauty and the lifestyle that she was leading. Now, I thought she looked a little bit long in the tooth for being a Gen Z Zoomer. However, if she was living the Coachella lifestyle, good for her. So I diligently trawled through her videos to see if I can find this influencer lifestyle. If she did have a beautiful people lifestyle, I could see that a few people would be haters and jealous. And this is what I found. I also used other influencers who had that Coachella lifestyle as a control to compare and contrast her life. We're currently in Coachella. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Not me. Um, no, we're not actually in like the grounds. Though. Right now we're in like the VIP shaded section. Um, we're just getting some food, some snacks. Beauty bite! I'm kind of holding it. I don't think it's meant to hold this much food. <laughs> While I found dozens and dozens and dozens of videos of her eating alone in her car or at home, I didn't find her interacting with any young people at festivals or gatherings. She was not a Coachella girl. So I gave her the benefit of the doubt. Not all influencers are outdoor people. She could be a nightclub and party girl instead. As she was adamant that people were jealous of her lifestyle, I did look for the parties, the nightclubs, the award ceremonies, and this is what I found. She was no Gen Z influencer. People wishing they were me. You wish you were me, you know. That's why you fucking hate, because you're fucking jealous. I'm in a very well-lit parking lot on a binge. It's 2.48 in the morning right now. Put 10. So Where my people at? Where my people at? She's not young, she doesn't associate with young people, she doesn't make young people content. She was not a Gen Z influencer. So there was one category left. But before I put her in that category, I had to make sure that she didn't have advertisers, sponsors and collaborators working with her. Because if they believe you are influential and an influencer, they will throw money at you. And there are people on YouTube and social media that have half her viewership and advertisers and sponsors still work with them. She didn't have any sponsors, she didn't have any advertisers, and she didn't have any collaborators or any brand deals. She was not an influencer. 
advertisers and sponsors will not work with people that are antisocial or unemployable for obvious reasons, no matter how many views that person has. There was only one place left that she could go, and that was in the category of the antisocial oddity. For the purpose of this video, we're going to give them 10 character traits. Their flight or fight response is wonky. Or to make it easier, imagine that there's a button for your flight and fight response. Their button is damaged. This leaves them in a permanent state of fight or flight. Normally, we would only go into fight or flight mode if we perceive something to be dangerous, intimidating or stressful, like being alone in an isolated park at night. But their flight or fight mode is on all the time, even when things aren't intimidating or frightening. It's a little bit rainy, but there's no wind. And it's good because there's no people. They will actively remove themselves away from people and stay by themselves. Now, this is not because they're scared of people or social anxiety. It's more sinister than that. If they can't control you, namely abuse you or use you, they don't want to be around you. And if they are forced to be around you, they're going to fight you. They are very godlike and dictatorial. They're superior. Don't try and cancel me. What? I don't give a fuck. What the fuck? I don't care. Cancel me. I do not care. I don't care. I exist outside of the matrix. No one can damage me. Doesn't matter. You can. I don't even have a fucking account. What are you gonna do? Ban me? I don't even have an account. Well, our opinions have been invalidated so many times of him that we're gonna disable his Patreon. Wow. Wow. You would really do that. You would really do that. I don't. Honestly, I don't care if I get re I deleted from YouTube. I don't care because I will rise. I will rise and I will go on any platform I want to. Don't you fucking worry and you will follow me. So there you go. Well, Chantel certainly ticked that box. Now, the next category was unemployable. Now, I don't mean unemployed because, as I said before, you can be unemployed and doing charity or voluntary work. I also don't mean the person is poor. You can be very rich and be an antisocial oddity. They cannot take instructions or orders from somebody else. They will abuse their work colleagues. They have very little job satisfaction or ambition to work. In fact, it interferes with their everyday living. We have two um, breaks. Every two hours we get a break. Um, after the first two hours, break. After the next two hours, that's when our lunch is, but really it's gonna be dinner. And then we get another break after the next two hours. So like this is our snacks. We sit at our desk all day long doing government type of deals, but let me tell you, we can't have snacks there, but the only thing we're allowed to have is chewy candy that isn't sticky or hard candy to suck on. Um, we got the lemon head kind, which has apple head, cherry head, and lemon head, like I said before. Okay, so these are the Tootsie Fruit Chews. We got some fruit, or some chewy fruities. Never had these before, but anything that's fruity and chewy, I will eat. I'm just going to do this back. Some crybabies to suck on, some crybaby. These are hard candies, they're sort of treats, fours, whatever. I've been unemployed for most of my adult life, and the worst thing about being unemployed is having to go to this stupid job centre. If you don't know what the job centre is, it's basically a place that you go to, and they give you money if you don't have a job. Which kind of makes you think to yourself, what's the point in getting a job if they're going to give me money anyway? So since I've got nothing better to do and I've got two hours to kill, why don't I give you a tour of where I work? I don't know if I'm going to get in trouble for doing this. <laughs> I'm going to quit anyway, so it doesn't really matter if they fire me. How can I use these women to make me money? I don't want to put them on the track because they're my women. I don't want mm. people touching And uh, by coincidence, I'm just Googling things up and I discovered this webcam website. And I'd never heard of webcam before. This is a long time ago as well. It wasn't as big as it is now. Now everyone knows about OnlyFans, all this shit. Like eight years ago, seven years ago, whenever this was, yeah. it wasn't nearly as big. And I found this little webcam thing. 
And I was like, mm, this might be some money. The third trait is that they're influenced by themselves, and that would make sense because they're godlike. Now, I'm not one for hero worship. That can be dangerous. But I do have people that inspire me, that influence me, and I admire. They have themselves. And it just feels unfair. How do they get visas so easily, and I'm just stuck here as a tourist? I look way more Japanese than they do, and I probably speak much better Japanese than they do as well. And I've been to Japan way more times than they have. And I think I have a much better understanding of the culture as well. They are rarely inspired by the achievements of others, so they will never try to replicate what they do to gain success. Instead, they get bitter. So they don't get better, they get bitter. And they think their achievements are much greater than they actually are. And the fact that I can sing in the shower, let alone sing Skyscraper by Demi Lovato and like not be out of breath while hitting those high ass notes, just goes to show like, wow, okay, you're doing your thing, Amberlynn. Amberlynn can sing a high note in the shower. Hmm. So she's now concluded she has normal cardiovascular fitness. Likewise, Chantel is so out of touch with humans, she thinks 25 minutes of walking is a flex. I just walked 25 minutes, Biatch. What? Huh? What? Yeah, let's not go there. Let's go there. If she didn't ask rhetorical questions all the time and bothered to speak to somebody else and listen to the answer, she would realise that 25 minutes is very, very poor cardiovascular fitness. It certainly isn't a flex. Body! This is my body! You are indeed right, sir. That is your body. What tends to throw the antisocial oddity into the public spotlight are their opinions. They're normally extreme and rigid, but also they have rules and regulations that they set out for other people, which are also rigid. While they cannot follow basic rules or regulations, they can create the most dictatorial, extreme and rigid rules for others. In human development, we all go through the stage where we are the centre of the universe, but we socialise, we mature and we grow out of it. They never do. If you remember being a two-year-old, you raised a two-year-old or you've ever worked with a two-year-old, it's all about what they want and what they desire. For various reasons, antisocial oddities never grow out of this stage. Because of her disease, it's difficult for this little girl to live a normal life, but her classmates are doing everything they can to make sure she feels included in playtime. Around the age of four or five, most people will begin to feel some kind of empathy or sympathy for people that are vulnerable. We have a sense of group and society and wanting to see other people happy. They don't. As they are godlike, they are above other people's rules and regulation. So they have a what's in it for me approach, even at a very young age. They cannot understand why people are following rules, regulations and guidelines written by riffraff when people should really be listening to them. Their views are never based on the good of the people, the good of society. Their views are based solely on their own wants, needs and desires. Some of their views might accidentally resonate with the masses, but if you listen to them long enough, it's like listening to a child. When listening to antisocial oddities, at first we might be impressed because the information we are being told seems unique and novel. After about 15 minutes, we begin to see some holes and some flaws in their arguments, but we still give them the benefit of the doubt because they impressed us in the first 10 minutes. 
and after 30 minutes, you realize you're listening to a mishmash of self-absorbed, tyrannical, unpractical, unworkable nonsense. You just should be thankful that they are not running a country and you are not one of their subjects because you probably would not be alive. Where my people at? Where my people at? Remember that I'm not talking about opinions. I'm talking about people that live outside society, creating rules and regulations, a manifesto on how society should live to please them. Staying on the manifesto, all their relationships have to be planned, which means they don't happen organically. If they don't have any use for you, they just don't want to be around you. If they can't use you or abuse you, you become utterly and thoroughly useless. You're right, when it comes to women, you've got a short attention span. No, women know too much. I'm all for girls that don't know too much. It's a different class. Here's a test where you meet a bitch for the first time. Say, what are you doing next week? Correct answer. Oh, nothing, just home. Attractive. That's what I want to hear. You ain't been nowhere. You don't go nowhere. Just home. Busy bitches, social bitches, unattractive. Uh, you're a hoe, you've been too many places, you're not home enough, you're not reading the Bible, uninterested. Everyone has their own personal preference of who they want to be around. It becomes antisocial if you are seeking out people to dominate and filtering out people because you can't use or abuse them. Now, if antisocial oddities were just filtering out or rejecting people that weren't a great fit for them, that would be one thing. But more often than not, they often belittle, dislike, resent and full out hate the people they can't use. They simply don't see any purpose in you existing. There was one time when I met this guy who knows my channel. I met him in Japan and then I hung out with a bunch of his friends and it was so boring. Okay, the first hour was kind of nice, I guess, but after about an hour or two, I just felt really bored and I just wanted to go home. I was sitting there listening to these people that I barely knew, listening to them tell me their life story and I just honestly could not care less. While they may filter out people, live in a bubble and live on the edge of society, not within it, they also set themselves up as experts of humanity. They use social media to vent their frustrations and anger about the world, but they just don't have enough puzzle pieces to build up the greater picture. As consumers of social media, and people that actually live within a society, we are curious to know what these adults with a few puzzle pieces actually think of the world. We know you live in a compound with your brother and you're not interacting with people. We know you spend most of the time hiding in your car or your house and you're not interacting with people. We know you've spent most of your life hiding in your childhood bedroom. And we know you get most of your opinions about the world from the comfort of your own bed. If you've reached the age of majority and you interact with a wide variety of people and you travel, you're going to know far more about the world than they will ever know. But you're still curious to know what is on their minds. I could have easily labelled them antisocial curiosities because people that interact with each other are curious about people that live on the edge of society. My personal view is I prefer to hear all that talk from a two-year-old rather than an adult. So far, we've heard about people that are not successful, rejected and filtered out by the antisocial oddity. But what happens if you're successful and you please them? Will these people make good romantic partners? Nope. That is because they're not attracted to you because they love you, like you, have anything in common with you. 
they haven't picked you because you have a shared interest and they certainly don't want to grow old with you. They have picked you so they can use you. You are there to fulfill their needs only. You're there to be used when needed and discarded when you're not needed. While they may not always name their partners, there is nothing taboo that they won't speak about concerning their partners. And they will use what would normally be private and personal moments as a form of entertainment on social media. Please, in your hand. I'm not. Give it to me. If you ever find yourself vulnerable or sick, a four-year-old will look after you better than an antisocial oddity. They are wired to have their needs met. They're not wired to give care or to look after people. They just don't understand how to do it. Their ideal partner is a robot. They don't grow old, they don't get sick, and they can be programmed to the person's liking. They don't understand what being charitable means. So they would never do anything like this. I see that he shaved his head. I cut it off. You cut off your hair? How yeah. come? To make Zach feel like he's not the only one without any hair. Just a few steps before the finish line, an exhausted athlete loses control of his body, which his opponents quickly take advantage of. All except one. ever find yourself in a weakened or vulnerable state, expect to be pushed to one side. As they live on the outskirts of society, not within, they don't have the same connection to people. They see vulnerable or weak people as a nuisance, irrelevance, and also taking away attention that could be directed towards them. They have a what's in it for me attitude towards being charitable. On a day to day basis, they will be cold, aloof and uncaring. They don't understand the emotions that some people have that stimulate them to help other people. That is missing in them. They will never do anything kind organically everything they do will always be planned. Human acts of kindness, which are organic, stimulate high emotion in us, but their acts of charity, which are contrived, often leave us cold. Despite his on-screen persona, Savile's attitude to children was apparently different when the cameras were turned off. He did not like children at all. He tolerated them, but that's about as far as it went for the value of the program. I think all children should be eaten at birth. As well as his TV and radio career, Savile was renowned for his charity work, raising millions of pounds for several charities. Jim, because he was Jim, liked high profile things. So he generated to things that had quite a high publicity value. If you are giving money or goods to get out of a problem or to get what you want, it's either PR or a bribe. It is not charity. And you are not charitable. In fact, you are the exact opposite. They do not understand or care about basic human suffering. They do understand if they give products or money, they can look good on camera. Oh no. I'm hungry. I'm like 800 yesterday. You should probably get some food. You look after yourself, Becky, because I won't.
So I am getting rid of this pile of stuff here. There's just like a grocery cart carrier situation, um, a blanket. Under here, there's like earrings, makeup brushes I've never used, purses, some books and stuff like that. And then I'm also getting rid of all of these DVDs, Pokemon cards. There are a few movies where I second guessed and I was like, oh my God, should I keep them? So we have made it to Goodwill, but it's closed. So we're just gonna leave it out here. Ta-da. Bye Goodwill. I will not administer CPR unless you're a hot female. This is the reality. If you're some fat dude and you just had a heart attack and I don't really know you, you're gonna die. Well, I had a heart attack. Get the fuck up. What's wrong with you? Go to hospital later. Have a drink. Cigarette, cup of coffee. Get back in the game. Fucking having heart attacks near me, little pussy. I live with a very, very pure heart. I'm a religious man. I go to church. Yeah. Anyone who follows me in detail knows I donate huge sums of money to the church. And as long as I knew the truth of my heart and God knew the truth of my heart, I wasn't interested in lies being purported. I have no sympathy for him. I have no sympathy for her. You don't understand why I hate those people? Then goodbye, you don't need to be here. I have no sympathy for her mom. I have no sympathy for that whole fucking retirement home. That is the logic of a crazed dictator that would burn down an entire city because somebody from that city was rude to them. Not long after posting this, she would seek out a random elderly couple, go on a social media tirade for a good 48 hours, assassinating every part of that couple's character. When challenged about her behaviour, she suddenly becomes the most charitable woman in the world. She's not able to understand the difference between selfless acts of charity and bribing somebody with goods to get what you want. And I don't give a fuck. If I want to give a fucking Cuban man a fucking laptop, I will. But if you don't like it, fuck off. Are you jealous that you can't give a man a laptop? What's your problem? I can give 10 men a laptop. Are you fucking jealous? Do you know how much money I make a month? I hate having money. I hate making $50,000 a month and I'm giving it all to poor people. Just not these poor people. They look rich and self-sufficient. They don't need computers. Ah, oh, this is much better. This is a type of person that needs charity. He can't afford a shirt. As long as I'm white and privileged, I'm going to fucking do everything I can with my money to help other people. I will be discussing her Cuban charity mission later. Antisocial oddities also have zero sense of humour. While they do laugh, it's not because they're enjoying a joke with their friends or they're enjoying a TV programme. They tend not to laugh with people, they laugh at people. And if they're not laughing at people, they're laughing at their superiority or achievements. Please. Babe, I don't know how to get all this in here. <laughs> you look like 10 miles of rough road. 
Everyone put a one in the chat. Their humour is often mean-spirited or just laughing at their own superiority or achievements. You could put these people on the moon and they would be able to live because they only care about flexing at locations and what people who are at those locations can do for them. They mobilise throughout society in a protective bubble, filtering most people out. They never will be a genuine visitor, tourist or resident in any location or country. They have no interest in surroundings and people within those surroundings. If you watch them mobilise the world, they refuse to adapt to situations, locations and people. They remain rigid and their behaviour remains the same. So that is the end of the list of characteristics for the antisocial oddity. So what does it mean for her in the long term? Antisocial oddities have no work skills and they are unemployable. So they have to make as much money as possible from social media. The general public is not as kind and loyal as they think. Just because ordinary or average people have developed empathy over the years doesn't stop us from being completely selfish. Once we get our fill or we've had enough or become bored with antisocial oddities and curiosities, we just move on to the next one. As they have no depth of character and they have a predictable lifestyle, once the novelty has worn off, we lose interest and we move on to somebody else. Ordinary people just have more skills in analysing their fellow humans. We have more puzzle pieces and we have more experience. While they appear to be unique, they are actually very replaceable. And secondly, because they do not make user-friendly content, there is a risk that they will become deplatformed. So if they are smart, they will try to make as much money as they can when they are in the public eye. Chantal has claimed to earn $50,000 a month. I hope she has invested it wisely. She certainly didn't spend that money buying computers for poor Cuban schools. She has been a benefactor to no one. And if she had interacted with people, she would have realised she could have written this all off as tax. This is just an extra bit I've added. I'm fascinated by travel vlogs because I do like people, but I'm not going to travel all around the world. I like to see ordinary people travel, interact with locals and tell me more about the countries of the world. But what fascinates me as well is how antisocial oddities differ from the average traveller. Remember, they don't have social anxiety. They are antisocial and they need to dominate people. So when I realised that Foodie Beauty went to Cuba, I was hooked. How would somebody who is antisocial with a broken fight or flight button behave in a foreign country? She booked a luxury inclusive resort in Cuba, which made sense. She was never going to be in an Airbnb or a hostel. She needed to be cocooned away from ordinary people. I was curious to see how she was going to make that transition from bedroom to beach without getting into a rage with other women. Was I wrong? Was I going to see her on a cruise? A jet ski, a speedboat, interacting with real people. She was flexing on her audience. They were jealous as usual. They were me. You wish you were me. You know. That's why you fucking hate, because you're fucking jealous. <laughs> Here, here's to you.
always remind our customers, if you're sad now, you might still feel sad there, okay? <laughs> you understand that makes sense? <laughs> our tours will take you to the most beautiful places on Earth. You're still gonna be you on vacation. As a dance teacher, I've never seen another human being do this move. But does he know you call me when he To prevent interaction with local people, she hid herself on a resort. And to prevent interaction with her fellow tourists, she spent a lot of the time in her hotel room. If you are sad where you are... I'm just mourning. And not just because of him, because before him I had problems too, and they just all magnified because they weren't resolved. Now I'm back to square one with even more problems. That's how I feel. And then you get on a plane to Italy. <laughs> to you, in Italy, will be the same sad you from before. Just in a new place. Does that make sense? People wishing they were me. You wish you were me, you know. That's why you fucking hate, because you're fucking jealous. <laughs> Here, here's to you. <laughs> There's a lot of vacation can do help you unwind, see some different looking squirrels. She never even looked at a squirrel just in case it made eye contact. But it cannot fix deeper issues, like how you behave in group settings. Fucking asshole, old piece of shit with wrinkly fucking balls. I hope you fucking... Honestly, this piece of shit ruined my whole fucking day at the lunch hall. He was in line going with his fucking backpack. Mmm. Mmm. I have a burger. And then a fucking relish. Oh, go back to Canada and get your fucking relish, you piece of fucking old shit. Eavesdropping on a private conversation is not enough to ruin anybody's day, especially when it's two old people talking about relish. Chantel had simply run out of people to blame her misery on as she was on a luxury holiday, so she just picked on a random old couple. Anybody else would have used this trivial topic as an icebreaker just to engage in conversation with your fellow humans, but she says nothing. Chantel blows it out of proportion, works herself into a frenzy and rages about them for 48 hours on live stream. Not fix deeper issues <laughs> or your general baseline mood. That's a job for incremental lifestyle changes sustained over time. People wishing they were me. You wish you were me. You know. That's why you fucking hate because you're fucking jealous. <laughs> Here, here's to you. what her favorite Cuba moment was by a fan, she didn't have a answer, so she avoided the question. Instead, she pretended she was so upset by her white privilege, the question was inappropriate. The reality was she hadn't gone there to make memories, she had gone there to flex on people and make enemies. My favorite Cuba moments? No, I want to I wanna complain some more about white people. Her white person manifesto was just more self-serving BS. Simply another excuse to justify why she was so miserable and angry on her luxury holiday. She could have booked a more humble holiday in a hostel, a hotel, a motel 
or an Airbnb and interacted with locals. She books the most privileged holiday you could get and moans about it to cover up the fact that she's having a miserable time. Once she left Cuba, she didn't help the Cubans in any way, shape or form. She didn't sponsor a poor child's education through school or university. She didn't donate books or computers or any kind of stationery to schools. She didn't even offer her services to Cuban charities to help people on the island once she left it. So she didn't even think of becoming a volunteer because that would mean work. Chantel is the antithesis of a charitable human. She used Cuban poverty to flex on her viewers and also to justify why she was so miserable. As long as she's giving men that look like this computers, I guess their Cuban lives don't matter. Chantel ticked every box, sometimes twice, sometimes thrice. She even managed to tick the box for being unemployable by not becoming a volunteer to help the poor Cuban people. This is part one of a two part series. Part two, I will be moving away from the mind and exploring the body. Chantel's diet, health and fitness. I bet she's good. Thank you.